I think we've been lied to. Um, do me a favor quickly, by a quick show of hands, who here was alive in December 1971? Right, so that's about 20% of you. Cool, I want you to park that for a second. And I want you to take you, take you back a few years before that. Uh, my parents had just got married. They were on honeymoon uh, around Ireland. Uh, it was the summer of 69. This is a fact that has meant that this guy is never very far from any of our family gatherings. <laughs> and at the same time as my parents were traveling to Ireland, there were three other people on a journey of their own. And it was these three's journey that meant that my parents, instead of being huddled around themselves at their honeymoon, as tradition would have dictated, they spent their honeymoon huddled around the television set, watching these events unfold. Out of half. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket twang, twang close. On the 20th of July, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first human beings to set foot on the moon. This was the end of an extremely high stakes race between two superpowers. And it had been kicked off like many, many things of significance by the powerful words, words of a great leader um, in the now famous moonshot speech. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Sadly, JFK never got to see the guys walk on the moon because, of course, he was assassinated just two years after the speech, and the journey took nine years, inside of a decade, as he promised. So he never got to hear Neil Armstrong as he stood in the moon, and he said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And this is the first place where I think I want to tell you that I think we've been lied to. It's the second line that I'm worried about. One giant leap for mankind. Was it though? Was it really the giant leap that we were told that it was? So I've Googled this. Now, first of all, was it, was it amazing? Absolutely. Was it technologically brilliant? For sure. Well, did it require bravery and all those kind of things? Hell, even if it was a hoax, it required those things. I don't think it was a hoax, right? I think it was real. However, was it significant? If you Google it and you try and find cool things we have because we landed on the moon, the number one thing you will find is that pen that you can write upside down with. I mean, it's handy one day, right? But for the most part, what you find out is the reason that it was so important for America to get to the moon was for the great victory over capitalism, over, of capitalism, right? Over the Russians. Because could you imagine how embarrassing it would be if we were here in 2018 with the Americans kind of controlled by uh, uh, some Russian guy? That would not be okay. <laughs> and in fact, while we talk about the Russians, this gets a little bit awkward, because do you know how many Russians ended up walking on the moon? <laughs> That's a zero. No Russians have ever walked on the moon. Now I want you to imagine you're in the middle of this big race for your life, this space race, and everyone, you're, you're done like 10 comrades back to back. You're getting up towards the finish line, and as you get to the finish line, the guy just in front of you crosses the line first. What do you do? Do you run over the line for second place, or do you turn around and say, ah, oh, well done, I'm, I'm fine, I don't need it, and go home. That's what they did. The race stopped here. And in fact, you must be wondering, I mean, you know, if it's this important, this much of a giant leap for mankind, why aren't we still there? In fact, to quote Roger Lanius, he said this, half the world's population has been born since we stopped going to the moon. <laughs> half the world's population has been born since we stopped going there. And it's not for a lack of trying. I was lucky enough to share a stage at TED Global in 2005 with this guy here. His name is Peter Diamandes. He is the founder of the Singularity University. And he there launched the Lunar X Prize, 20 million bucks if we could get somebody back on the moon. Do you know how that prize is going? It's not. We had to kill it off. I say we, I mean him. It got killed off earlier this year because the deadline passed in March 2018. They didn't manage to do it. Now, let that sink in for a while. 50 years ago, what they managed to do with the technology they had then, in just nine years, they were not able to replicate in 13 years with the technology we have now. That, you know, Moore's Law be damned. How can this even be a thing? And I'll tell you why it was a thing. Because it doesn't matter. It's not that important. It turns out we don't care enough about going back to the moon. Why? Because we found somewhere else that we can get to first. There is another race going on, and that is a race to get to Mars. Why? I'm not really sure. 
but these two guys seem hell-bent on going, <laughs> right? We've got another race going on, and this is another race of superpowers, but it's super powerful billionaires who want to get us to Mars. They are so excited about this, and we huddle around over our TVs, and we look at them, and we watch them, TVs, <laughs> computers, and we watch their rockets take off, and we're like, hashtag inspired, hashtag excited, why? Why does this matter to you? Why are you excited that these guys are going to Mars? And then you're like, well, what if we mess up Earth, Richard? <laughs> you know, what if we do that? Fair enough, that could happen. However, if you can consider for a second the amount of money they're spending trying to, you know, build some big, like, luxury villa on Mars, if we took the brain power required to do that, you know, just in case the world ends. If we had taken the brain power and the money and the finances required to get us onto Mars and spent that instead on fixing where we live right now, maybe, maybe that would be a better idea. <laughs> it's like they're trying to put an ambulance down in the valley instead of a fence at the top of the cliff, right? Let's start with that. I want to take you to another event in history, an event that was watched by 35 million people around the world. This event was called Motown 25, and it was the 25th anniversary of Motown Records. And that day, another 25-year-old took the stage, and in front of this audience decided to unleash this on the world. <laughs> the first time the world ever saw the moonwalk. Can you imagine you were there? Can you imagine you saw that for the first time? That would be crazy. Now here's the thing. It wasn't actually the first time the world saw the moonwalk. It used to be called the backslide, which gives me a new point of view about Christians, <laughs> you know, when they're wayward. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually, it had been happening for years. It turns out that Michael Jackson did not invent the moonwalk. But you know what he did? He perfected it. And that, for me, is where we start and get into this rub of this story. Because what I've realized is that we overvalue the act of being first and undervalue the act of being better. That's the key for me. Because for most of us, that's where the magic is at. It's my guess that 99.99999% of us, right, will want to change things. We need to be aware of this lie of the first mover advantage. We have been fed this line that being first is the best thing that can happen to us, but I don't think it's true. I actually think that there's a first mover disadvantage. For the rest of us, right, our greatness and our opportunities for greatness will come not from creating the future, but from fixing the recent past. That's the key. It's a power about fixing the past, a power about looking at something that just happened just before us and then changing that. And look at the evidence, right? MySpace came along and they were a fast mover. Facebook, the first fixer. Alta Vista came along and they were the first mover, right? Google, the fast fixer. And this goes on and on and on. Hipstamatic came along, they were the first mover. And of course, Instagram was the fast fixer, and WhatsApp, and Nike, and all kinds of things that came before that. It turns out that the power goes to the fastest fixer more than it goes to the first mover. Now, before you think that I'm telling you that first movers aren't important, nothing could be further from the truth. I do think they're important, but I think it's a job that's important for somebody else to do, right? If we can get that, there's a lot of ego tied with being first, and it's amazing, but if we can move away from that and understand that the power comes later, that's a very, very empowering place to be. And to illustrate this, I want to take you back to 1971 again, to a different global arena, the arena of One Day International Cricket. Now, One Day International Cricket was a sport that had a ceiling of its own. There was a score that was you know, all elusive, that nobody could get past. That was a score of 400 runs. Nobody was able to make 400 runs. It just was deemed as impossible. Until one day in 2006, an Australian team came over, and they were playing, you know, expecting to get there, you know, 399, let's hope, like everybody else would do, and something happened. They forgot that they weren't supposed to be able to get 400. And accidentally, they were terribly embarrassed, they didn't just beat the 400 record, they smashed it and scored a staggering 
four runs. Now, I know that you can guess where I'm going with this thing. I'm going to tell you now that like the four minute mile, once it dropped, you know, subsequent games, it dropped again and again. And you're partially right because it has been now beaten 19 times. In the 13 years that have, uh, or the 12 years since then, 19 times this has happened. In fact, South Africa has done it six times. But what's amazing to me isn't that it happened in subsequent games. What's amazing to me is what happened that very day. You see, when Australia woke up that morning, they woke up in a world where 400 was not possible. But when South Africa came out to bat that afternoon, they came out to bat in a world in which 434 was. What did they do? 438. 438 runs. I'm sure many of you remember watching that day. It was unbelievable. But all of a sudden, they had a reason to believe. You see, the person who hits the ceiling, they flip the foundation. And that new foundation is what all of us can build upon. We're all able to build on that new flipped foundation. And that's what we have to be looking for. So why is it then that the guys who build the first, the first movers, why is it that they're not winning? Why don't they win? And sometimes they do, but statistically, it doesn't happen. Well, there's a few reasons for this. The first one I want to talk about is the idea of sunk costs. You see, what happens is these guys get very, very invested in an idea. And for them, when they get, let's say, MySpace, you were working on MySpace and you were building this up and you had this vision of what the world would look like with MySpace. And then what happens is you get up and you're coming to your launch party and you're running up to the end of this marathon finish line and all of a sudden, MySpace gets launched to the world. And you've just finished a marathon and Mark Zuckerberg comes over and has a wee look and he starts his sprint. Because he doesn't have to do all the work, you did it for them. Think about in cycling. When we see any time a cycling race or anything like this, what do you see? Do you ever see the champion that's expected to win doing all the work from the front? No. The champion waits behind. He rides with the slipstream, with his teammates, dragging him, doing all the work. Those guys swap and swap and swap and swap and swap. And then right as it gets close to the finish line, he is catapulted ahead into, into victory. This is what happens. And it happens in team sports, but we've not figured out it's what happens competitively as well. That's the key. And there's something else. You know, when I was riding here today, when I'm on my motorcycle, when I'm lane splitting through those, those roads, I'm the one who's taking all the risks, right? Oh, that's where that bit was. <laughs> I'm the one who's taking all those risks. And then we've got to worry about this. We've got to worry about the factor of novelty versus utility. You see, here's the thing. When we do something new, like, say, go to the moon, it turns out there's a lot of novelty in that. The problem with novelty is that it invariably it wears off. The novelty of things wears off. And the key is the way that technologies survive, it's an issue of impeccable timing. The way they survive is if somebody comes right at the peak of novelty and discovers utility. When we discover utility there, we win. That's what we have to be looking for, the utility that can be born out of the foundation of novelty. That's where it's at. Let me give you an example of this, an example of a technology that could have been exciting, a bit like a, a, a cure that has failed to find its disease, and that is augmented reality. Now, when augmented reality first came out, everybody had it in front of them, and they, you, know, you would take out your camera, your phone, and the magazine, and that car would come to life in front of you. It was the domain of the marketers, as well it should be, because marketers trade in the currency of the novel. But then, the novelty wore off, and we hadn't managed to find a real good use for it up until that point. So it parked for a while, until somebody come else came along, and they said, hey, we can use this for a game. And Pokemon Go started. And all of a sudden, it was OK for grown-ass men to climb into your garden, right, <laughs> to come and try and catch a Pokemon. But when's the last time that happened? Right? Turns out, not so much utility there either. And this is the key for me. In fact, I saw a headline earlier on this week. There's a, a company called Giant Leap, or Magic Leap. And it says, has augmented reality pioneer Magic Leap, Leap fallen off a cliff? And they have, and you know why? Because they didn't find their utility. We had this cool novel technology that everyone has had fun with, but we can't find something decent to use it for. And that's the key for me, is to understand that the, the giant leaps trade in novelty, but it's the small steps that find their utility. That's the key. 
I want you to go back to these guys again and to realize something about them. You know, I was maybe putting them down a bit and being a slightly disparaging about them in the terms of their giant leaps. But the truth of the matter is, both of these were fast fixers. Elon Musk fixed payments, fixing cars. Jeff Bezos fixed e-commerce. They were the fast fixers in that space. They are able to become the giant leap, the first mover in the new space, because they were the fast fixers before. This is the key. This is what we have to do. Apparently, there's lots of keys. <laughs> what I want you to understand is that Michael Jackson, he saw this guy, and he envisaged this. And Mark Zuckerberg, he saw this guy, and he envisaged this. I want you to stop trying to walk on the moon and start instead trying to find and perfect your moonwalk. Right? That little slide backwards that guy did that day, you know, laid new ground and propelled his career forwards. Right? The real job, the real job is to see the potential in the first iterations. And that's why I find myself so excited about a new technology like Samsung's new foldable screen. Now, the world all says this is novel, but I'm excited about the potential that can exist when technologists discover something they can do with screens that can fold. Right? Because Samsung have created a new foundation for the rest of us to build on. So I want to leave you with a new framework, a new way to think of questions, a new way or a new question to ask yourself. I want you to stop asking, what will we be doing tomorrow? And instead, I want you to replace that in your minds right now with this. What can I do today because of something that was invented yesterday? Right? For me, the key <laughs> is not to go where nobody else has been, but to see the potential that nobody else has seen. If you see that, you will unlock the potential of a brave, exciting, wonderful new world for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, forget your moonshots. Learn to moonwalk. I can't moonwalk! <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.